From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Let's get a check on the markets. They're up again today, second Monday in a row. Abigail Doolittle is here. So, Abigail, feels a little bit like last Monday. Every morning we get up on Monday morning and we have a new vaccine candidate. <laughs> it certainly does. Deja vu all over again, David. We do have a nice risk rally here for stocks, popping by more than 1%, the S&P 500, the Dow, the NASDAQ not quite as much, and that speaks to what we saw last week. So this week, of course, it's Moderna. Their vaccine candidate has been proved to be 94.5% effective uh, in more than 30,000 volunteers. So we have this nice cyclical rally. Moderna itself is also popping, uh, and that is the reopening trade. So we have folks looking at six to nine months hopeful that we will, in fact, uh, have an economy that will be able to normalize more so if and when this vaccine, and it doesn't seem like if, it's a question of when the vaccine really gets out there on a more widespread basis. Now, of course, this is bringing what we also saw last week. So we have the travel and the leisure stocks really popping sharply higher. On the other hand, the stay-at-home trade, the Zooms and the Pelotons of this year, those are down. It's going to be interesting to see how much of our behavior over the last, let's call it nine months, David, uh, trickles forward into the future, even as we we do reopen, but right now those stocks are being sold off. But the one piece, as you and I were talking about earlier, not quite fitting into the puzzle, bonds just about flat. So bonds are not selling off. That might speak to the more difficult uh, month to three months, maybe even a little bit longer ahead as the vaccine is really raging here in the U.S. Or excuse me, the virus is really raging here in the U.S. ahead of the vaccine actually getting out there. So bonds a little bit more near term, looking at the reality. Stocks more optimistic, doing what the S&P 500 does looking out six to nine months, David. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle. And later this hour, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Celine Gounder, NYU, a member of President-elect Biden's COVID advisory board. A short time ago, Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute and former Treasury Secretary, appeared at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, and he set out a comprehensive new approach to U.S. relations with China. Welcome now, Secretary Paulson, back to Balance of Power. So welcome, Mr. Secretary. Good to have you here. So let's spend just a minute on the New Economy Forum. You're having this at a time when we're about to have a new administration in the White House. Uh, and we're going to hear, actually, from the president-elect a little bit later, about an hour and 45 minutes from now, about the economy. What is the best advice for this administration coming in to try to get the economy in the United States and, for that matter, globally going again in the face of a pandemic? So, so, David, first of all, on the, on the New Economy Forum, it's it's an amazing group because we've got 500 of the lead, you know, business leaders, government leaders, acad academicians from all, you know, from the East, the West, U.S., Asia, uh, Middle East, Africa, and you're there looking to the to the new uh, Biden administration. They're looking ahead. I think there's sort of a profound sense of relief because uh, business needs predictability. And uh, so, and, and, and this forum is focused on, uh, on crushing the virus because it's ravaging the world's health and, you know, the economy. And so that's going to be a, a big focus here. And, and I think for, uh, for uh, you know, President-elect Biden, uh, the, his huge focus initially is going to, has to be domestically, right? And uh, to crush the virus here, but to... You know, we're going to need some more stimulus in the interim, and I'm really focused on the recovery package because, you know, a lot, a lot of what I talked about was competing with China, but the, the road to success there begins at home, and it begins to the kinds of things we need to do to fix our economy and make it strong, and, uh, and th that has to do with everything from investing in education and reforming you know, Im Im immigration policy, so we attract talent and, and you know, upgrading our social safety nets for the most vulnerable. And I think a big part of it has to be a, a uh, you know, a big, big part of it has to be sort of a, a infrastructure program that is going to emphasize not just bridges and roads, but technologies that are going to be the uh, the, the the key to our long-term competitiveness. So, so what are the prospects of that as a practical matter? You spent time in Washington, not just on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs. Uh, can we get that done? Can we get the sort of big infrastructure package going that you say we have to have? I, I think that's the $64,000 question. I, I, I sure hope we can, because uh, one thing we've got for sure with uh, uh, the incoming president is he's shown an ability to work with Congress and, and, and cross the aisle. And 
I, I think he's he's going to need to put together a package that's, that that speaks to all of America, right, and speaks to the kind of reform. And I think there's general agreement we need infrastructure. And so the, the question is, how are we going to pay for it? And I think there's some interesting ideas to pay for it. And uh, and again, I want to see a package that's focused on our long-term economic competitiveness. So Secretary Paulson, let's turn to the subject of your talk at the New Economy Forum, specifically U.S.-China relations, because I think there was a lot of perception that whatever one thought, President Trump really did get the economy going again, largely through tax cuts, through deregulation, and that perhaps some of his tariffs on China, some of his trade with China stood in the way of growth as a practical matter. We tend to think about this as either free trade on the one side or uh, protectionism on the other. We had Wee Kei Chong actually just come out at the New Economy Forum and, and decry protectionism. You have a, sort of a third way is the way I interpreted it. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm not for protectionism. I'm not for isolationism. You know, I, I start off by saying, listen, uh, President-elect Biden understands China. The team around him understands China. But, but I, so I have confidence in that. But he's inheriting a relationship with China that's going to be fraught for the foreseeable future because th this is a very strategic competitor. And this is structural. It's largely structural. You know, when you have an established power and a rising power, and the, the rising power's got a very different economic system, political system, ideology, competition is baked in, 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 into the relationship. That's going to be a cornerstone of the relationship. So the key is how do you have competition and keep it healthy without it becoming, you know, becoming really destructive? And... Uh, here, one of the points I make is the goal should be competition without unnecessary confrontation. Because what we've seen is confrontation without effective competition isn't working for the American people. It's not making the world a safer place. And so as I think about the competition, it's largely economic. Sure, we're concerned. Of course, we're concerned about military competition. But the at its core, it's economic because our military strength is ultimately rooted in our economic strength and vitality. And so here, so it comes down to, so how do we have smart competition, competition that, that, uh, that, that doesn't hurt the United States while we're trying to, to contain or hurt China, right? And, and so this is where I talk about targeted reciprocity. A, a, a the key to the Trump administration's policy has been the idea of reciprocity, right? Deal with China as they deal with us, right. open markets, uh, it, it, you know, it, in the U.S. that uh, it, only as China opens them, you know, uh, for, for U.S. companies. And, you know, that doesn't make sense. It, it, it sounds good at 100,000 feet, but if... if it's flawed to the extent that if we make ourselves look too much like China, we're not going to ultimately be as successful as we need to be. So again, you know, I'm I, I'm looking at I did not favor the, uh, the the Trump tariffs. They're attacks on Americans, but they're also really make it hard for our businesses to be successful, to be treated as reliable suppliers. It, you know, doesn't make the U.S. an attractive destination for for foreign investment. But as long as we've got those th those tariffs in place, most of the damage is done. So I think there's great opportunity for uh, the incoming president right. to have negotiations to open up the markets where we're most competitive. Right, right, and it's terribly important, I think, as I understand what you're saying. You, you didn't favor those tariffs, but now they're in place. You don't say that a President Biden should come in and just take them all off. There should be negotiation that tries to help to try to create some of that structure of the competition you talk about. When you compete, you want to pick where you think you can do well and where you have to do well. You don't compete necessarily on all fronts. Where do you think the United States should say, we're going to compete there? Okay, I'm going to pick one area right now because there's a, a good number of areas, but I'm going to pick an area in, in the environment because one area where we know that there's going to be a change is climate change because this is a key part of the Biden agenda. And so there's a lot of ways we can work with China cooperatively. You know, we have to if we're, if, 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 if we're going to make any real progress here. But I believe we need to continue to 
treat climate change like any other economic issue. And so I don't like the fact that there's all kinds of tariffs on environmental goods and services. And China's got tariffs on environmental goods and services. And there's this huge market in China. There's a $3 trillion market as they continue to seek investment you know, to clean up dirty air, dirty water, dirty soil. We've got great technologies in the United States, so we should look to open up that market. I also, you know, I am delighted that China, it's very important that, that they made the carbon neutral pledge. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, that uh, President Biden will rejoin Paris. But one of the things we have learned is that as important as UN voluntary agreements are, they aren't going to solve the problem in and of themselves. They're not going to come close to solving the problems. So we're going to need to put new structures in place involving the major economies, structures with teeth, and that, uh, you know, that uh, avoid the, the ability of, of, of countries around the world to free ride mm -hmm. and have real incentives to curb carbon. Carbon. And, and so, again, uh, my point here is we need to treat climate change like any other economic issue. We're going to cooperate, but we're also going to, 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 to negotiate tough. Yep. And competition is in our DNA, I think. We love competition in the United States. But how can you compete when the competitor on the other side is the government? You said there are fundamental economic and political differences between these two systems. And I think right at the core of that when it comes to economics is they're state-owned enterprises. They are in the game. They're the ref and they're also in the game. Is it possible to structure this in such a way that we can effectively compete with the government? Listen, I believe that we have a system that is better over the long term and it's gonna prove itself out over the long term you know, they, they have authoritarian state capitalism, okay? So I, I think our system is, is going to prove to be better over the long term. I really, I very much believe that. But in terms of opening the Chinese market, I think there's certain things that are gonna be very difficult to change, but there are plenty of things that we can change there. And you're focusing on the right, the right topic because the, the Trump administration had, had been looking to open up, been looking to negotiate old style purchase agreements. And I, I think the key is to look to the future, to look to industries of the future and make structural changes. And, you know, the protectionist uh, tool of choice in, in today is, is not really tariffs. It's regulatory barriers, subsidies. Uh, and, and so you need to work to break those down. And I think what the the incoming administration should do is open a wide ranging, a sweeping uh, uh, trade negotiation, investment negotiation with China and at looking at structural issues. And I think that they should, they, they should focus on some of the things that will be easier to get done initially. So you get some things done and, you know, use some conventional and un, uh, you know, unconventional tools to, to force compliance. But a big part of this is going to be working with our allies. And I think the huge opportunity and challenge that a President Biden has is to restore global cooperation, right? And a key part of that is going to be figuring out how to work with our allies to exert maximum pressure on China. And that comes right on the heels of this major agreement, you know, the regional comprehensive economic partnership that China participates in involving an awful lot of Asia. Does that make the President Biden's job a lot harder? It does. It does. As we've been absent for four years in terms of trade agreements, you know, in, in Asia, it was just a travesty that we weren't there for the TPP, right? And so we look at... All, the, the Chinese market being opened up for all sorts of other economies and, and, and we're sitting on the sidelines. And so the key basically to, uh, to, to success in our competition with China is leading domestically, strengthening our economy at home and making sure it's a model and being a leader overseas. And I, I don't know how we're gonna lead overseas unless we're gonna get trade deals done and we're going to have to, and that's going to be a challenge because I, I will tell you, that Republicans and Democrats, I regret to say, are, are becoming more isolationist. And how does that make sense in a world where 
96% of the people are outside of the United States and we're a large part of the economic growth is going to be out of the United States. And so many people want to reject the idea out of hand, which is just absurd that it, we don't benefit from, from participating in the Chinese market. Even today, as unbalanced as it is, we benefit significantly and there's an opportunity to benefit much more and to these other growing markets. Right. And our, our, it's a huge benefit that we have so many outstanding multilateral right. companies in the United States. Right. But how are they going to be as successful as we want them to be unless right. we resolve some of these issues? And we need to just, right. one of the things that, that, that the incoming president will need to do is work with China to determine where we're going to compete, right. Right. where we're going to cooperate, and where we're going to be adversaries. And until we do that, it's going to be very hard yep. for businesses to be as successful as they need to be. And as I'll call it, targeted reciprocity. Thank you so much. Hank Paulson, it's always a delight to talk with you. That is the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson. Coming up, we'll talk with energy expert Elizabeth Sherwood Randall of Georgia Tech about what a Biden administration energy policy might look like. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on wow. Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger says the incoming Biden administration should move fast to restore lines of communication with China that frayed during the Trump years. Speaking at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, Dr. Kissinger said if not, the U.S. could be risking a military conflict. I'm listed in some places for some cooperative action, the world will slide into a catastrophe comparable to World War I with a technology that is uh, even more difficult to con control than the technology of, our pe of, of the period then. Dr. Kissinger, who paved the way for President Nixon's historic 1972 trip to China, said he hoped the shared threat of the COVID-19 pandemic would provide an opening for political discussions between the two countries when Joe Biden takes office. One more sign that the fast-paced hunt by drug makers and scientists is paying off in the fight against the coronavirus. Moderna says its vaccine was 94.5% effective in a large late-stage clinical trial. The news comes a week after a similar uh, shot developed by Pfizer and BioNTech was found to be more than 90% effective. New York City schools will be open tomorrow as the positive test rate for COVID-19 remains below 3%. A rising infection rate led Mayor Bill de Blasio to warn parents that schools may be closed today, but the rate dipped over the weekend. Mayor de Blasio said, quote, we've got a fight ahead to keep them open. New York City's seven-day average of new cases jumped to more than 1,000, something de Blasio called very worrisome. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 scientists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to check in on those markets. Joining us now is Kaylee Lyons. So, Kaylee, we have a second Monday with equities going up because we have an, yet another vaccine candidate, I guess. Yeah, that's right, David. We had Pfizer last Monday, Moderna today, and it's really Moderna that is driving this entire equity market at the moment. The company, uh, the stock itself, is about 8% higher, trading at a fresh record high after rallying the most since July on releasing its preliminary analysis of a large, a late scale, a late stage, large scale study of its vaccine candidate that proved highly effective, an efficacy rate of about 94.5%. Virtually all of the 30,000 patients involved in this study did not show any COVID-19 symptoms, uh, did not contract the virus after receiving this vaccine. And another notable point was the stability data from Moderna. 
The vaccine is stable at a refrigerator temperature for about 30 days, so a longer than expected shelf life, which could ease the distribution challenge. Uh, so again, this data, though, is just preliminary. We expect the final results towards the end of this month, but the company said this could be a game changer. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, which of course is the top infectious disease expert in the U.S., called it remarkable. And as you said, David, it's not just Moderna, but we got something similar from Pfizer. That vaccine candidate uses similar technology to Moderna's, and both of these companies are expected to see accelerated use authority from the FDA if they do indeed prove safe. So, Kaylee, in the past we've seen sort of a rotation out of, I'll call the stay-at-home stocks into the let's-go-out stocks. Uh, and I guess that some of the let's-go-out stocks are up today. But initially the NASDAQ was down. Now it's back up in the green. So is it just taking everything along with it? Uh, to a certain extent, you're still seeing a lot of those stay at home players you were referring to the likes of Zoom and Peloton are under a bit of pressure. They are lagging the outperformance in the broader market, but it's not so much that tech is down as everything else is significantly higher, specifically those cyclical sectors. Think energy, materials, industrials. It is those names that are leading in the S&P 500 today. And what's really noteworthy is the small caps, the Russell 2000 hitting a record high. Again, that is that pro cyclical pro reopening. Uh, the economy is going to do better in theory trade that we are seeing play out, though you're not seeing, as you alluded to, big tech under as much pressure as we saw perhaps last Monday, but they are still lagging uh, in a broader sense, David. So it's clear that equities are liking what they're seeing, but the, do they believe it? Uh, and I <laughs> guess I ask that question because if you look at the bond market, it's not entirely risk on. There's just a little bit of uh, trimming on the bond market. And also I heard a rumor this morning that maybe the volumes on equity futures were not going up, which is an indication maybe they don't really quite believe it. Or they already were expecting it, I think you could say, David. I think there's a question of how much of this was already priced in. Given that Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines use that similar technology, and we know that Pfizer had that 90% efficacy rate in the data it released last week, everybody was expecting something similar from Moderna. So it may uh, just be, you know, we already expected this good news, and therefore the bond market isn't reacting to such an extent. And you also can think about it on a time horizon. Yes, we're getting potentially a vaccine, but you have to scale it. You have to distribute distribution. It. All of that could take time uh, far out into the future. The equity market may be willing to price it in that far in advance, but the bond market may be less so, David. Yeah, I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much to Kaylee Lyons, that great report on the markets. Coming up next, former Obama administration energy official Elizabeth Sherwood Randall on the transition from energy under President Trump to energy under a President Biden. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. A member of the Trump administration may be acknowledging that President Trump lost the election. Speaking at a global security summit today, the president's national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, is pledging a, quote, professional transition, end quote. Mr. O'Brien indicated that Joe Biden appears to have won the election, something other top Trump officials have been reticent to say. Over the weekend, the president tweeted, quote, I concede nothing, end quote. The head of NATO has spoken with the new acting U.S. Defense Secretary about the alliance's commitment to stay in Afghanistan as long as necessary. The conversation comes amid speculation that President Trump might order a rapid withdrawal of American forces in the country. Last week, the president fired Defense Secretary, Secretary Mark Esper, who had tried to talk the president out of complete troop withdrawals from Afghanistan and Syria. Billionaire Stephen Schwarzman has a way to make teachers stand out in the workforce. The co-founder of Blackstone Group said they should be the only group of workers in the United States exempt from paying income tax. Schwarzman spoke at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. It will mark them apart from all other types of employment as a valued uh, class. Um, it'll also increase their after-tax uh, compensation significantly. Schwarzman also noted that only 5% of children in public schools are learning computer science. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. President-elect Biden will come to office having laid out a vigorous policy for clean energy during the campaign. 
Georgia Tech Distinguished Professor Elizabeth Sherwood Randolph served as Deputy Energy Secretary in the Obama administration after serving in the Obama White House as Coordinator for Defense Policy, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, and Arms Control. So, Professor, welcome th welcome to Bloomberg. Great to have you here. Let's start with that plan for clean energy that uh, Vice President Biden, now President-elect Biden, was very assertive on. How much of that can he get done without a majority in the Senate? Because that's up for grabs, as you know, in Georgia. I think there's a lot that can be done because this is a strategy that will integrate energy, climate, the economy, and security agendas. And there, all Americans have a stake in a recovering economy after this pandemic is under control. And so I would describe to you quickly four main lines of effort that will be pursued that will be doable and also achievable with cooperation across party lines. First of all, is to achieve greater efficiency in how we use energy today. That's actually a relatively easy win, improving light bulb efficiency, fuel, vehicle fuel economy, doing more with consumer goods, and pushing toward a decarbonized economy at home also positions our businesses to compete for global market share, which is growing for decarbonized goods. Second, we need to strengthen our innovation ecosystem, which is a huge American asset and will be a win-win for the American people, generating clean energy solutions and accelerating job creation, again, of interest across party lines. Also, this is going to have to be on a grand scale. It's going to include investments in lots of cross-cutting platforms that will support innovation in other sectors as well. We also need to invest in clean energy infrastructure to support the decarbonized economy of the future. And there, there is clearly bipartisan support for modernized infrastructure, hardening our power grid so that it will be the backbone of a new economy and one that's more resilient to the threats that it's facing. And fourth, we need to rebuild partnerships. There, I'll just note, President-elect Biden has made his career on reaching out across party lines. It's something I've seen him do since I first worked for him almost 35 years ago. He'll build bridges and coalitions in Congress, and he'll also reach out to the world so that America can lead again on this important agenda. Yeah, that was very helpful in laying out how we might spur on, maybe on a bipartisan basis, some of the development of clean energy. But what about reining in, if I can put it that way, on the fossil fuels? Because he's also talked about things like cutting subsidies to fossil fuels, cutting back on fracking, at least on government lands. Uh, can he get a lot of that done without support of the Congress, and particularly the Senate? You know, I think the government needs to focus on developing all the tools that can contribute to radically reducing carbon emissions so we can meet our net zero goals by mid-century, the goals that President-elect Biden has set forth in his Build Back Better plan. The government will work on generating optionality because the needs of different cities and states and regions and countries will be varied. And we have to meet the needs of the workforce in each of those places. So in that sense, investing in technologies like carbon capture utilization and storage will be crucial for oil and gas countries. Similarly, we'll want to invest in lots of new technologies that haven't been invented yet to meet our needs going forward. So I have confidence that we'll actually bring the American people along with us in this bold endeavor because it will be about a better future for all of us. How much of this is the government uh, spurring on or reining in, whichever it is, and how much was just the markets going in that direction anyway? When we heard uh, the president-elect now say on the debate stage where there's going to be a transfer away from fossil fuels, that has already been going on, hasn't it? It has been happening already, and the markets have moved ahead of us because in the last four years we have fallen behind. And other countries have taken the lead in developing their businesses, their technology solutions that they're bringing to market. That's why I said there's enormous opportunity for us with the greatest innovation ecosystem in the world, combining federal investment where the market isn't quite ready to put money to grow new technology solutions like the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, ARPA-E, modeled on the Defense Department's famous DARPA, which can bring some technologies forward to the point that the market is willing to invest in those technologies and bring them to broad deployment. So I see this again as being really basically an innovation chain where the government invests where you need early investment and the private sector picks up when it needs to move out to market. Professor, talk about one area that you were responsible for in the White House, as I said, and then over the Department of Energy, which is arms control, nuclear arms control. Uh, do we have a sense of where President Biden will take that? We know that President Trump was trying to get talks started again, start talks started again with Russia. 
So of course I'm speaking as a private citizen here, but I'll say I have worked with Joe Biden since uh, the mid 80s on arms control and know that he is committed to both ensuring the safety, security and effectiveness of the American nuclear deterrent, which protects the United States and our allies and partners, and also to reducing our reliance on nuclear weapons and building collaborative regimes with other countries to ensure our mutual security. So there I have confidence, for example, that if uh, when we achieve the transition that we just heard on your, your clip, the National Security Advisor has now said will be a professional transition. I look forward to seeing that happen. Uh, then we will have uh, steps taken after Inauguration Day to extend the new START Treaty, the last remaining arms control agreement between the United States and Russia, and a deliberate effort to build on that for new um, achievements in reducing the threat of nuclear war around the world. As a matter of policy, would you advise, understanding you're a private citizen, would you advise that we go back in that intermediate range uh, missile treaty that we've pulled out of with Russia? You know, I think we need to look at the full array of issues on the table between the United States and Russia. Russia has developed mod novel new nuclear weapons and new delivery systems over the past years. And we'll need to consider all of the elements of the equation as we develop a new approach to re-establishing strategic stability, which is at significant risk today. And finally, let's talk about that transition you referred to. Uh, what are the risks at this point of holding off on that transition further? And in fact, there's changes being made in some of the areas that you were responsible for originally, Professor, in Department of Energy, including the head of the National Nuclear Security Administration. Is, is, there, is, there, is there a cost in this delay? Certainly, in my experience, when I had oversight responsibilities for the transition in 2016 from the Obama to the Trump administrations, we were extremely vigilant because we judged that adversaries would perceive the transition period as a potential moment of weakness. And so you want to be even more focused on security threats and ensuring that the handoff is absolutely steady without any balls dropped. In this case, because of the delay, you could see risk, although I also have confidence in the career people who are remaining in place to protect our security and look out for our interests around the world. I also know that the people who are working with the president-elect are extremely capable and competent and experienced, and they're going to be ready to lead on day one, regardless of what happens during this transition period. So this is a terribly important point, I think, that many many Americans may miss about the transition. And this certainly applies to energy, but more broadly. Uh, we see a lot of political appointees being fired right now, being moved out. But there is a civil service there, uh, very uh, smart, experienced people, a lot of intellectual capital that, that the president essentially cannot really change, right? Well, he's sought in, some, in many cases to marginalize uh, and penalize those who have sought to speak truth to power, who were among those career civil servants. Think about the diplomats, for example, um, who were uh, uh, moved out of their jobs because they challenged the president's approaches. Uh, we've seen this happen in a number of agencies on climate policy. But I also know that we have people who are willing to sacrifice their careers if they're going to be penalized because they know they need to do the right thing. And in this particular instance, what we are relying upon is the career military uh, when you're talking about our security. And there we have a Joint Chiefs of Staff that do not change, uh, that remain in place, and that are responsible for our forces out in the field today around the world, ensuring our security and the security of our allies and partners. Professor, it was really helpful having you today. Thank you so much for your time. That is Elizabeth Sherwood Randall of Georgia Tech. Coming up, we talk with a member of the Biden Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Celine Gounder of NYU Langone. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Markets greeted news of another potential vaccine success story today with enthusiasm. How does the Moderna candidate compare with the Pfizer vaccine we got results on a week ago? And what lies between successful tests on the one hand and distribution on the other? Welcome now an infectious disease expert. She is Dr. Celine Gounder, clinical assistant professor of NYU Langone Department of Medicine and a member of the President-elect's COVID task force. So welcome, doctor. It's great to have you back with us. So give us your read right now on this Moderna candidate as opposed to the Pfizer candidate. 
Well, there are some key differences. Both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines rely on mRNA technology, which is a, a previously unused. Uh, so this is somewhat um, uncharted territory. These will be the very first vaccines that we'll be using that are based on this technology. Both of them uh, appear to be highly effective, at least based on the data that's been shared with us so far. One key difference, though, between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is the temperature at which the Moderna vaccine needs to be stored. The Pfizer vaccine, we've heard, needs to be deep freezed uh, at minus uh, 70 degrees Celsius. So that really is not something that the average doctor's office can accommodate. The Moderna vaccine, in contrast, uh, can be uh, frozen or refrigerated at a more normal range of temperatures um, for up to 30 days. And so that means it's a lot easier to distribute than the Pfizer vaccine. So as a scientist, as I understand it, there's a lot more data you'd like to take a look at to really understand either one of these better. I mean, specifically, who were the people who got uh, COVID, who did not get COVID, comorbidity, uh, terms like that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm told that they might be able to apply for emergency use authorization as early as the end of this month. What do they have to have to, in order to ask for that authority from the FDA? Yeah, there's some um, guidelines that have been issued in terms of a minimum of numbers of patients enrolled, numbers of events. So when we talk about events, we're talking about numbers of people in the placebo arm who did not get the vaccine versus the vaccine arm who got coronavirus, um, because that's the only way to say, you know, was the vaccine actually protective? Now, one thing that's accelerating that collection of data is the fact that coronavirus is surging across the country. Uh, so we're getting that signal more quickly. And then also data on um, numbers of side effects. So, so far, both of those vaccines Scenes, based on what we've seen so far, seem pretty uh, safe and effective. So uh, are there other candidates that are in the pipeline that could be could, could be coming up like next Monday, for example? It seems like every Monday we get an announcement now. Yeah, there are two others that are very uh, shortly after in the pipeline, the Johnson & Johnson as well as the AstraZeneca or, or Oxford vaccine. Those are, are both also pretty far along. And there are a host of others that are in the pipeline after that. So I think it's important to understand that there will be a number of vaccines that will probably get emergency use authorization uh, that will start to scale up in the coming months. And really part of the decision will be which vaccines to use for what populations in what areas. And, and that will be an evolving thing. So let's assume, and I understand it's a big assumption that we get through all the tests and the answers are good answers and we can actually distribute this vaccine. What would it take to distribute millions upon millions of doses of vaccine, particularly because both of these candidates, as I understand it, you need to do it twice? Well, right. So both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines uh, uh, require two doses, um, so about a month apart, three weeks apart. Uh, so that in and of itself is a bit of a logistical challenge because you need to make sure everybody who got the first dose gets a second dose. Um, and, and, you know, we're all busy. We have the rest of our, you know, things that we're doing in our lives and might forget to come back for that second dose. So we, we need to make sure that happens. But I think people underestimate the complexity of these supply chain and delivery systems. You know, think about personal protective equipment. That's a very simple technology, you know, masks and face shields and gowns and gloves. But look at how difficult it has been to make sure we had adequate supplies of those throughout the course of the pandemic. Now multiply that in difficulty by a new technology that requires being kept at cold or ultra cold temperatures. Uh, this is this is not going to be a simple distribution logistical challenge. And everybody's going to want it at once, I suspect, apart from people who really are just nervous about vaccines. Uh, how are we going to decide who gets it first? And more specifically, to the best of your knowledge, are there plans in place right now, either at the federal or the state level, to say this is the priority we're going to give people? Uh, those plans are in development, and some of those are occurring at the state level. Some of this is also going to be happening within the Biden-Harris transition team, uh, planning at the national level. Um, but big picture, we, we do have some sense that the targeted populations are going to be frontline healthcare workers, very high-risk populations. So, for example, people who are living in nursing homes and assisted living facilities and the like. And then after that, you'll see an emphasis on people who have underlying medical conditions that put them at very high risk for severe disease. 
You're one of a, a group of very distinguished scientists who are part of this task force for, for President-elect Biden. Uh, there is concern right now about the transition and the transition not happening the way maybe it would normally happen. From your experience, from what you know, is that a big problem or not? Because, or, or basically, do you have the data that you need at this moment to start working on what happens after January 20? Well, we have the data that's available to us, uh, that's available to the rest of the public. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you think about the fact that we are essentially at war, we're at war with this virus, if we were in the middle of a world war with a foreign power and we did not know precisely where our aircraft carriers and our tanks and our troops were, it would be very problematic to continue waging that war during a transition of power. So on the one hand, we are gathering all of the data that's accessible to us, it's available to us, but we really need to see the GSA move forward on ascertainment so that we can really get insider information uh, to move forward with our own plans. And what are your priorities among the task force? I mean, what, what are you trying to take on first, second, third? Well, one of the things you'll see very early on is that the president, through an executive order, will be invoking the Defense Production Act to scale up production of personal protective equipment. So again, that's the gowns, the gloves, the masks, the face shields uh, that have been in short supply throughout the course of the entire pandemic that are in even more scarce supply now that cases are surging and demand is surging across the country. So that will happen very quickly in the new administration. It's something that we've been pleading the current administration to do right. for months. In addition, other really uh, key priorities are testing. Uh, the current administration has really discouraged testing, but it's very difficult to contain a virus if you don't even know precisely at any moment in time who's infected and in what places and, and why that's happening. And Dr. Gounder, we're going to talk to you about that a little bit a little bit for now. That's Dr. Celine Gounder. She's a member of the President-elect Biden's COVID advisory board. We're going to have more with her coming up in our second hour on Bloomberg Radio at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Coming up here, we hear from former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger on COVID-19 and its effect on U.S.-China relations. Speaking at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Henry Kissinger was the architect of U.S.-China relations in the modern era. He spoke earlier today at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum on what COVID means for international relations and whether there is a global solution. Its long-term solution has to be on some global basis. Then within that framework, the performance of countries that solve the problem both of their internal medical needs and of the uh, uh, global or regional method of solving it uh, will, uh, may affect the position of those countries. But I don't think COVID should be dealt with from that point of view. It should be dealt with as a lesson in the need of certain issues that can only be dealt with on a large basis, hopefully even a global basis. And are those is that what you referred to at the beginning in terms of a framework of issues that China and America could come round together on? You could do COVID, climate change, trade. I, I'm not saying that we and China will live with a consciousness of harmony uh, I am saying that there will always be stresses and tensions, but the question is, is there a direction towards which we can, in which we can cooperate? And uh, there'll be other issues on which we will differ, but unless there is some basis for some cooperative action, the world will slide into a catastrophe comparable to World War I with a technology that is uh, even more difficult to con control than the technology of, our pe of, of the period there. 
That, of course, was former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Watch more from the New Economy Forum on Live Go through your terminal on Bloomberg.com and on Bloomberg New Economy's social channels on Twitter and Facebook. This is Bloomberg.